you mentioned and alluded to the danger of a fall in, in later yes. life. And um, this is something we've been doing a lot of research on internally, um, given our concern around bone mineral density in the aging yep. population. Um, the mortality yeah. when you look at 65 year olds and up who suffer a fall that results in the fracture of any part of the hip or femur uh, at one year, depending on the study, it can be yeah. you know as low as 25%, as high as 60%. Yeah, the magic number is usually around 40, 50. Um, yeah. Again, it's I want people to understand what we just <laughs> what we just said. You take all the 65-year-olds and you look at those who fall and the fall results in a in a broken hip or femur. And you ask the question, how many of those people will be alive in 12 months? The answer is half of them. Correct. And, Correct. And and the other half aren't the other half it's not like the other half are are uh yeah, they're you know, not they're uh, not back to themselves necessarily. No, exactly. You know, and, and that's exactly right. So you you want to avoid a major health hit like that for sure. You know, and the other thing, Peter, there's a couple other things that have really hit me as we've talked. One is is this man named Lester Breslow, who was this very famous epidemiologist who who uh, died in his late 90s, was at UCLA for many years, and he studied people in, in Oakland in the late 50s and early 60s who made it to 90. And the sorts of four or five uh, things you talked about, he he identified the people in Oakland who made it to 90, and they were non-smokers, they weren't obese, they remained physically active, they ate modestly, they stayed engaged in life, and there was just five or six things that they did. And the same is true in the Honolulu Heart Project, when they've looked at a huge number of Japanese-American males, same exact stuff that you mentioned. Not so, they weren't as focused on the small molecules, but 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 exactly what you've described. And then I think about, you know, we've, we've talked about natural experiments. At the Cooper Clinic, they've looked at, at people's fitness levels. Now, that's not exactly the same as physical activity, uh, but, but in general, the fittest people are also the most active. And they divided people into three or four groups of fitness and then had them look at a so-called healthy eating index. So, you know, were you a junk food junkie? Did you eat okay? Or were you really conscious of your diet? And, and the healthy eating index uh, in people that weren't particularly fit did have something to do with all-cause mortality. But among, among the fittest people, there was very little impact of, of diet on, on, on the outcomes, which is sort of interesting. It always brings me back to the famous quote in a, a book about distance running called Once a Runner, where somebody said, uh, yeah, if the furnace is hot enough, you can burn anything, even Big Macs. Now, you have to take that with a grain of salt, but... Or I guess if we're worried about diet, maybe not a grain of salt, but but I, but I think it does kind of give you the take-home message, but just about what yeah, a powerful I, thing exercise is. I completely agree, and and I know it's very um, there's a very common mantra that says, "Oh, you can't outrun a bad diet," and I would argue that's probably not true. I think you can outrun a bad diet, <laughs> so, it's, but it's pretty hard to do, and most people well, don't understand yeah, the amount of yeah, running yeah, that's yeah. needed to do it. Th that's great because you know, again, I'm I'm looking up these studies, so I've I've looked up these classic studies like that, and so so. There, there's this incredible study from the 50s of, of people who worked at a jute plant in, in uh, India, and they categorized people on incredibly physically active, you know, doing manual labor, hacking away on, on, on jute to make, I think, linen or, or rope. They were going to make rope with this stuff, all the way to office workers. And as you got, as you got more and more uh, physically active, people got lighter. As you got more inactive, they got heavier. But what was interesting is, is people that were in the middle, middle kind of rung of occupational physical activity also had slightly lower caloric consumption and remain, remain very trim. So certainly, you know, uh, if people are physically active enough, if you read the old papers about what lumberjacks were eating, you know, uh, when they were chopping wood all day long, I mean, it's five, 6,000 calories a day. Uh, the, the old order Amish who walk around and do manual labor all day long and don't have, you know, don't have, uh, don't have uh, tractors and stuff like that. They eat an awfully lot and, and very few of them are obese. So, so I, I think you can't outrun a bad diet or can't out exercise a bad diet in a modern uh, high calorie, low physical activity world, I think is the caveat that has to go to that one. 
Yeah. And yet when you look at athletes that are doing insane amounts of exercise, oh, yeah. most of them have a hard time keeping on weight. Well, there, there's, yeah, there's a terrific study about the Tour de France, you know, where, where, where they get done every day and they're, they're just handing them food. And, um, you know, these people are eating ad lib, except when they're on the bike and even when they are on the bike and they have a hard time and they're eating 6,000 calories a day. They weigh about 150 pounds. Yeah. Some, and they have a hard time keeping their weight. weight yeah. They're, they're, they, be, they are catabolic throughout the tour. Correct. And they, they finish Correct. in pretty bad shape. Correct. They, 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 they look like, you know, uh, you know, well, not survive, not death camp survivors, but, but people who certainly haven't had a lot to eat for a few weeks. 